right, well, thank you, everyone. Can you hear me? All right. Thank you, everyone, for, for joining. We've got a, a great panel today. I'm really excited to introduce uh, some of the folks here. Um, I'm just going to do, I'm just going to kind of name who's here, and then I'm going to let them do a quick intro. So we've got Dan uh, from Getty, Sebastian from Scalar, Shen from um, Rancher. Rancher.io, and, and, uh, and Mark from, from Redapt. I'm Jeff Dickey uh, from Redapt as well. But to kind of kick this off, can you do a quick intro, Dan? Uh, like Jeff said, Dan with Getty Images. Uh, we are the company behind a lot of the imagery you see every day in the news or in uh, editorial content or in a lot of creative stuff. Uh, we are responsible for most of the editorial imagery that's coming out to uh, both to uh, websites or web pages as well as a lot of stuff in press. Uh, I manage uh, the tech services group at Getty, which is responsible for pretty much everything outside of dev. Um, my name is Sebastian Seidel. I'm the founder of Scalar. We do uh, policy and governance for uh, multi-cloud, OpenStack, Amazon, Azure, Google Compute Engine. Um, and uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm Shen Liang. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Rancher Labs. Uh, we build a Docker container management system. And really, the, the, the vision behind it is we should make do technologies like Docker should be able to run on top of any cloud and make porting workloads between one cloud easier to another cloud. And you know, it ultimately give user more choices between different kind of cloud providers. And I'm Mark Williams, uh, CTO for Redapt. Redapt is a systems integrator that helps companies build out data center scale infrastructure and provides cloud solutions uh, on top of that infrastructure. In a prior life, I was actually using Redapt as my vendor. In my prior life, I was responsible for operations at uh, infrastructure operations at Zynga, where we exploded into Amazon and ultimately built a large private cloud to deal with some economic issues and performance issues. I was also a customer of this gentleman when he, he was also the founder of cloud.com, which was the originator uh, of, open, of CloudStack. Yeah, so I think um, in putting this panel together, I mean, we've got some interesting uh, dynamics here. We've got customers, partners, partners that have worked with customers, um, uh, former customers that have worked with all the partners and now you know, part, of, part of our company. And we've, we've gone through a lot of different financial modeling, financial issues, financial barriers, but I mean, kind of the, 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 the gamut. So we're going to kind of talk about that. And um, so just kind of kick it off. Well, I mean, first, OpenStack is free, right? Totally. Is, all day. We all agree that that's free. Um, what, why is cost everything in the whole cloud ecosystem? Well, ultimately, it comes down to IT and the perception or the, the expectation of the business to have that be as small a fraction of a percent of the cost of the company as possible. Uh, that derives necessities like, you know, laying off people when there are downturns and having kind of all of the innovation that every customer asks for at no incremental cost. So just the always impossible problem. Um, it's just inescapable. I think you couple that also with, though, with the perception that we are on a, like a daily basis we're getting screwed by from an IT perspective. The expectation that when you see an advertisement for AWS or you hear about an advertisement from Rackspace or GCE or whoever, the expectation is that they are faster, they are more nimble, and they are cheaper than what your IT organization can provide. So if, as an IT group, you're constantly struggling with the perception that has already been set with your CIO or worse yet with your COO, your CFO, and your CEO. The one possible differentiate, differentiator, and this was actually true for, for what we were able to do at Zynga, is the technology teams at Zynga did make Zynga more interesting as a, as a company because of what we were able to say about we, what we were doing with private cloud. There was technical credibility that added value to the company, and ultimately in, in the way we proceeded down our path, actually saved the company money, meaningful amounts of money. But yes, you are always compared with the things that are marketed so well open stack that you know ultimately aren't free at the end of the day and cause extraordinary amounts of pain so let's go back a little bit just uh, a year or so back to the kind of the the pricing cloud wars what 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 has the what's that really done to the private cloud landscape and you know especially that's that's really the open stack uh, landscape what, what what's happened is it helping hurting well, what are we seeing now um, so, so I'll, I'll take you that. So, so uh, one, one thing that's been uh, that I've observed in like the maybe a little bit more than the last year, but 
Um, basically, like for the longest time, Amazon was the only game uh, in town. And what we've seen here recently is that because of alternatives uh, on Google, soon Azure, uh, OpenStack as well, CloudStack before that, um, you, you can now, your CFO can now have a legitimate vendor uh, leverage uh, um, strategy where you can source your, your, your infrastructure from two or more vendors so basically you, you can get you know, optimal pricing. And it used to be you couldn't do that at all just because Amazon was so damn ahead of everybody else that your developers went straight to them and couldn't really move elsewhere. And so now you have a lot more pricing power. So I think that was kind of like the impetus for a lot of the price wars uh, that led, all, led all to, to all of that. I'll add kind of one of the themes I've experienced in my two years at Redapt. So when I first joined Redapt, there were a lot of customers that were emulating that same desire as the Zynga story is moving out of Amazon, which was comparatively more expensive four or five years ago, and seeking to have that same story as Inga did, where you know investment in CapEx delivers long-term savings and a you know, reasonably uh, achievable, in terms of time, ROI. What happened after April 1st of last year when Google really dropped those prices is a lot of that ROI, certainly the t time to ROI extended out, and the amount of ROI uh, eroded too. So where I used to have customers coming to me with their Amazon utilization reports saying, well, what does this cost to do as a private cloud solution, <laughs> which we could do for them. Um, I, in fact, one customer I delivered a report to them in March, and they were still kind of absorbing that. And then April 1st hit, and I'm like, I've got to tell them, I've got to do this analysis again. And I redid all of the ROI analysis, and, and I'm like, hey guys, I'm redoing this for you because the whole story just changed, and no longer are we recommending that you buy a private cloud solution from us. You should stay where you are. The other thing that I've, I've observed is the perception of IT security fears or governance fears about public clouds being safe has eroded quite a bit for two reasons. One is, gosh, when you make something cheap enough, you have less of an argument to, to, to push back. The second one is the lack of breaches. You just don't hear. It's not Amazon getting breached. You know, it's nothing, nothing no bad news is, is, is kind of good news in the end. I, I do want to follow up, though, with your, your point around stuff being more expensive or less expensive. I think that there is very clear uh, economies of scale that come into play. And, and you see this most obviously uh, in places like Rackspace. Rackspace obviously does not have the scale that AWS does, but Rackspace is still making a very good living off of providing cloud services as well as uh, cloud solutions as well as the services that they wrap that in. So there's a question of scale. At what point does it make sense for Rackspace to actually run their cloud on AWS? That's an interesting question for you to ask because obviously it's not at whatever point they're at now. So you keep stepping that back and saying, at what point is a, a, some type of enterprise customer who's running, say, 10,000 servers, 10,000 nodes, at what point is their cost to actually run that and manage that internally versus in an external solution? At what point does that kind of hit a delta? And do they get some type of strategic advantage, like you talked about, either in the industry that their company can use? There are places where that, that uh, economic benefit of using AWS or using other people still, even today, is, uh, is still better to bring it in internal. Um, if I can refine that just a little bit. Um, also, the, the scale question, <clears throat> Uh, breaks down at multiple layers, like at what scale do you need your own data center? Do you need your own power and cooling? Uh, that, that's a scale that's much further than that. what scale do you need your own couple of racks in, in an aisle? So I, I actually feel like, you know, clearly last, uh, last April, the, the, the latest pr price cut of last April, and t I think yesterday there was another round of price cut from Google. Uh, but, but I think these price cuts certainly changed the conversation quite a bit. And, and it seems like you know a lot of people, like Mark said, will no longer do private cloud for for cost saving reasons. But I, you know, haven't haven't been through. Um, uh, I've been in this industry since I mean, since since you know, 2009. We started. You know, really nobody uh, at that time really believed uh, Amazon would would be as powerful as they are today. And, and a lot of the bets were put on private cloud, and, and I think there was a bit of an inflated expectation for public cloud, and, and, and oh, for, for, for private cloud. And, and, and now it, I think, I, I feel like the, 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 you know, the, the prevailing uh, wisdom is it's gone completely the other way. You know, not only public cloud is the way to go, but also Amazon, or maybe Google, or maybe uh, 
maybe Azure would take over the world. And and I think that's uh, I think we definitely have a tendency to to just over oversimplify that. You know, knowing. Uh, uh, the varying degrees of, uh, of, 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 of desire for people to uh, uh, consume cloud services. I mean, actually Gartner, the same, same uh, group that actually put up the report, a lot of people quote, I mean, they, they put it succinctly, cloud is by no means a commodity. So there's just so many other reasons that, that, that people would use to pick their, their cloud provider. I would say, I mean, one obvious thing, if you go outside of U.S., uh, you know, the, 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 the picture is just entirely different. In most case, places around the world, Amazon even, isn't even the number one or number two cloud provider. And, and they will find it hard to believe, except these countries actually have more computing, is gonna have more computing resources than the US. So, uh, so I think you, you really gotta keep that in mind, keep it in perspective. I, I have a feeling uh, the you know uh, we're 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 at a distinct point in time. Of sometime down the road, looking back, uh, we'll realize you know perhaps this 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 uh, you know this vision of just three dominant players uh, supplying all the computing power to the world is is is, is, is probably not going to happen. So yeah, I'll do uh, just one more question. I'll open it to the audience. Um, <clears throat> so you know, we're talking about. Uh, economics and, and specifically AWS and, and the, the public cloud, if, if that ROI is, is, you know, really makes sense and it's really hard to compete technically with what they have and, and the speed at what you can do with what they have, why, why are we seeing so much popularity in the private cloud and the OpenStack deployments and, what, you know, why is that happening? So uh, I'll take that first. Uh, um, so uh, there, there's a session that I kind of participated in before where, where NASA was talking about why they're building out their OpenStack, uh, their OpenStack cloud is um, basically at the end of the day, it's, it's all about the data. What they do is they, they beam about 65 uh, terabytes of data per day uh, from, you know, from outer space. Um, and, uh, and that's collected in a data center that were, where they have the deep, uh, deep space network um, in Alaska. And the pipes are ju just not big enough to be able to throw that all the way to Amazon. Um, so the only thing that can do is build out a big data center out in Alaska and, and, and do the compute close to where the, the, the storage is. Um, so, so there's lots of use cases like that. There's lots of, you know, like in Germany, you might want to have your own open stack there for the privacy laws that they have. So compliance or data are really the big drivers that I'm seeing. Uh, data is, is certainly not, not one of them anymore. Yeah, I'll add that performance specific requirements for certain workloads is another driver. So, for example, that customer I mentioned that I said, not a good idea for you to pivot to, pri uh, to private cloud right now. They were already in a public cloud. They knew their, their, their existing performance. They knew what the private cloud would look like, but it didn't make sense. But a lot, oftentimes companies have workloads that just aren't cost effective or performant in an Amazon or another one. It could be an I.O. constraint. It could be the data gravity problem. It could be uh, any number of things. The other re reasons I would agree is, is jurisdictional, yeah, you know, so laws that, you know, gambling casinos, for example, they need to drop what little open stacks into, into casino regions where it's legal to have such gaming. Yeah, and you touched on it a little bit. I think that expanding on that idea, there's, there's also migration cost. There's a lot of systems that may take a significant effort to move over to an external cloud provider that may be easier to keep internal because of latency challenges, because of other challenges like that. Uh, but I think also that we need to not totally fool ourselves. There is a lot of hype too. Uh, the same emotion and or uh, whatever you want to put uh, there, the same, the same thing inside of people that says I love open source and I don't like Microsoft Windows is the same thing that is making people say I want to build an open stack environment. And yeah, AWS exists, but that's, that's for the rookies. I also, I think for a lot of consumers and especially businesses, at the end of the day, it's never one size fit all. Price isn't everything, you know. Uh, if that were the case, nobody would have bought a, you know, Apple product or shopped at Whole Foods or, you know, every, I mean, all the, uh, you know, there wouldn't be any Herman Miller. Everyone would be, all the offices would be, have, would have IKEA furniture. So it, it just, it, you know, the world of uh, just a really I, I don't know what you're trying to say there. <laughs> service play, uh, you know, supplying all the computing needs, right, while the computing resources is, is, is plentiful, is, is, is is not necessarily going to be the future because at the end of the day, unless you are a, a you are the kind of business that spend this 
proportional amount of uh, um, uh, uh, you know your, your your revenue on computing resources, where you know absolute five percent saving of computing cost is is essential. Like for most businesses in the world, I mean, they, you know, you, they want the good stuff. They want they want customized stuff. So so I actually think there's there's quite a bit of a bright future for uh, for the kind of technology we're talking about here. Yeah. So, um, th th so there's sometimes there's like uh, like on Amazon there's like very good reasons to be, to be on it, but sometimes there's also artificial reasons. Uh, for example, if you're deploying, if you're using Docker Hub, Amazon very actively throttles bandwidth from Docker Hub to external cloud providers. So if you're trying to launch uh, some containers on Google Compute Engine and you need to pull containers that are you know hundreds of megabytes or, or heavier, um, then, you know that's going to take forever to deploy. So sometimes there's those artificial reasons as well. Is there, what about the human element? I mean, don't we just kind of want it to be ours? Our racks, our build? You want to hug your cloud, Jeff? I do want to hug my cloud. <laughs> Let's open it up. Uh, do we have any questions so far? Can, we, can you mind using the mic up here? It's just right, uh, yeah. yeah. You guys hear me? Yep. yep. Okay. So the, the thing I would add to that as a major motivator is just control uh, because it, it, the reason to go private cloud is simply because you can control it better. So you, if you have a mission critical app, for example, that is going to slow down or shut down your business and you're debating whether to put it on AWS, you look at uh, the risk of failure on that and you could be bringing down your business for 24, 48, or whatever how many hours, uh, and you have no control over that, and your recourse is to get a refund for your fees. So even though the risk of that is very small, the stakes are too high. And if you're sitting there as a CIO, you're not, you're not going to take that risk because it's your job. I can tell all, you I've been Sam. through five major Amazon outages and three private cloud outages. They, there's no guaranteed safety by controlling it yourself. Yeah, I, it's, it's the opposite. Outages are a reality. Um, and Amazon isn't going to give you a credit if, if their whole data, a whole data center, in fact, I think two of them can go down in a region, and you're still going to get zero credit. And initially, as a consumer of that, when it was early for, for us, it's aggravating. That is not the expectation. But it actually forced Zynga to be smarter about how the applications were designed, how we would deploy them. We kind of, we were beaten into submission, especially because while we were early in Amazon, they were having data center outages. They were growing too fast. And as a result, losing entire power for data centers. And so it, it forced us to be smarter about that and to build in resiliency in, in how we would do our operations. Yeah, I, but expand on that. I mean, I think that anybody who doesn't build in resiliency is completely going against the entire objective of what we're trying to accomplish. When we talk about a cloud native or cloud aware application, we aren't just saying, hey, let's go do OpenStack and it, it's awesome. We're talking about, it doesn't have to be immutability, but it is the intelligence around, I am able to understand that my environment won't always persist or exist. Like I'm, it, you're moving away from, and I'm, this is not a knock on VMware, this is just a reality of how we use it. You're moving away from a situation where you have a VM that goes down, that, that, that server goes down, and before we had the ability to do vMotion or, or storage vMotions, like you had to get that VM back up. Right? We're, we need to move away from that. So uh, to, your, to your question around the control, I have, I have about 120 people, engineers on my team, uh, that I would, I would you know, not literally die for, but I would figuratively die for because I know they're that good and I'm so proud of what they've done, both in the open stack for our greenfield and in the brownfield. However, I'm not gonna compare them against the massive cadre of engineers at Amazon. I will trust the Amazon engineers before I trust my own to keep a data center up, especially when we're talking multiple AZs, uh, just, just because of scale. Yeah, and just visibility to what is changing. So yes, Amazon is going to be very obscure about specifically what's changing. They're not going to give you any visibility to specific maintenance events other than at a micro level, like this instance is going to die, blah, blah, blah. But it just forces you to, to build the right instrumentation to know what is changing. What are your humans doing? Because humans are the biggest cause of all of this anyway. Yeah. Outages, is that what that is? So kind of moving back towards more, more on the private cloud side and OpenStack. What? Uh, I think we have another question. Oh, another question? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, perfect. Go ahead. Well, I was going to I was going to change the subject a little bit if you want to head it an add on. Um, but you know, my my question is more about you know you're doing a lot of comparison between public and private cloud. 
but I'm wondering if you've also done the ROI analysis within the private cloud itself, like between OpenStack and other private cloud technologies. And also, you know, you, you mentioned that, you know, okay, so OpenStack is free. We all know that it's not completely free because you're putting a lot of labor in if you're using the pure open source. But there are also products available, commercialized versions of OpenStack as well. So I'm wondering if you've kind of factored that in terms of private cloud into ROI analysis. Yeah, that's perfect. The, I was just going to ask about, you know, build or buy, like what the different experiences are and, and when, when do you do that? When, do you, when is it DIY? When is it vendor related? When is it open? Or when is it supported open? You know, when? Um, I, I still think CloudStack is a very legitimate option out there. It, it's very good. Um, it's definitely not as customizable as OpenStack, and it's, it's you know, customizability of OpenStack is awesome. Um, but uh, yeah, I still think CloudStack is, like, if, if you fit within what CloudStack offers, a uh, very clear path. Yeah, there are other, I mean, I'll keep going on that list. There's Joint. Joint is another one that they offer a public cloud and the identical software for a private cloud. They have a great story. But again, it's a very utilitarian offering. It's, it's compute and very basic storage. And there's actually huge value in, in kind of committing to only subscribing to those things. The, the more simple the layers that you adopt as you architect how you're delivering infrastructure as a service to your, to your customers, the better, the easier it is to operate, the more predictable its behaviors are going to be, and as the complexity evolves on top of that cloud, that with applications becoming more increasingly cloud native, your, your job is easier as an operator and as IT, or as an IT person. I think I thought you were going to go down a little bit different path. I think the one other thing that we haven't talked a lot about is the strategic reason for which you're using a, any cloud solution, whatever it is. Uh, so for, for Getty, when we look at cloud solutions, we don't look at it and say, like, what are we strategically, uh, what, sorry, what is, what, are this, what is the best technology or what is the best cost, right? We, well, actually, I'll be honest, it's not totally to my point, but we first look at the people, right? Our people really and our technology, knowledge, or capability or desire to attack something is really first and foremost probably to where we go. But secondarily, we look at the strategic decision. So for example, uh, it would be, like I think most of us agree that it would be foolish for us to build an expense management system or an HR system. Uh, in this day and age, you've seen Concur, you've seen Workday, et cetera, you've seen other, and there are lots of other PaaS, or sorry, SaaS-based solutions like that that would say that's not strategic to what it is that Getty's trying to deliver. So let's, let's outsource that to a quote unquote cloud provider that isn't OpenStack or something that we build ourselves, uh, but is very, is very aligned with where we're trying to go. Then for those things that are strategic that we are building and investing in, then we look at the, the solutions internally that we use. And I'll be totally honest, uh, you know, as, like, and, I, and this, is, this is going to be almost an embarrassing statement for a VP to make, but we don't look really hard at cost. We look at cost boundaries or cost, you know, kind of guardrails. If you're way outside of, of supportability costs, operational management cost, or acquisition costs, of course, some of those are just gonna naturally ebb out. But once you get into some type of threshold, uh, you're going to make the decision based on other factors, other than cost. Yeah, to, to play on the people aspect and the strategy aspect, mm -hmm. expecting your people to be able to absorb or kind of acquire domain expertise in many different technologies so that you can play the vendor game, like yeah. you know, pit multiple private cloud vendors or pub to public cloud or all three different, like that, that's extraordinarily difficult in terms of investment. It does give you that long-term kind of price power and pushback the same way you would have in, in a Dell versus HP kind of traditional hardware play, but getting your people to really yeah. be able to manage all those differences that matter. It, at this That's stage critical. of the game, if you're able to build out multiple clouds and test them against each other, run workloads on them, then you are flush with cash, and I want to come work there. Right? <laughs> I, yeah. and part, did we ask, answer the question, too, about just kind of the cost comparison of each one? Like, I mean, are, are, is it kind of like, is VMware more expensive than OpenStack and vice versa? <laughs> we, we've done that. I mean, we, yeah, we've seen that, and we've, we have put together OpenStack clouds that are way more expensive than VMware. It's just because of the requirements, but it was that agility that they wanted, and it met certain requirements. So, and again, it was more of a talent play, like you're saying, and that, that's kind of an economic decision with your talent, so it kind of goes right into that. Um, we got another question. Yeah. So, uh, change the subject a little bit. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, so you made some comments about um, security and compliance and performance and those things, and, and I, I think I get the security issue that, that uh, the public clouds are, are very secure. The compliance issue is something that um, 
I just wanted to get your insight into, do you see any movement from the public cloud providers or maybe even their customers trying to change the compliance type laws, lobbying for those types of things? Uh, I mean, is that argument with for a private cloud going to go away? Um, I'll tackle that uh, on the Amazon front. So right now, Amazon's the only one that uh, that offers something like you know, uh, that is a cloud that's ITAR compliant. It's called GovCloud. Um, Azure doesn't have something like that yet. Uh, uh, Google Compute Engine doesn't have that yet. Um, so that, that's kind of like the only option you have there. If and if that doesn't fit what you need, then then OpenStack's the, the, the way you need to go. Um, so that's on on the ITAR side. On the um, on the HIPAA side, uh, Amazon's technic uh, is is uh, technically HIPAA compliant, but the problem is that they won't sign the BAA, uh, which means that they won't assume the liability of da data loss uh, that HIPAA forces onto you. So if you lose some healthcare records or things like that, um, it, Amazon won't take the liability for that. And that's natural because you know it's self-service, which means that you can screw yourself up and, and you don't want Amazon doesn't want to just eat that liability for no cost. Uh, so right now, so if you if you're building out a cloud that has, uh, you know, where where it needs to be HIPAA compliant and you need to have that BAA signed with your provider, OpenStack really is the only way to go, um, or a private cloud really is the only way to go. Um, there's lots of uh, vendors out there of managed cloud solutions that will want to sign that for you. Uh, or with you, and uh, that's because they, they'll do that architectural review and vetting with you, so that you know, so that you know, the system is truly cloud native. You can't lose that data, uh, and, and therefore, uh, or there's lots of safeguards in place. Therefore, they're willing to eat that um, to take on that liability. I yeah, also want to quickly mention something. This stuff really varies. Sorry, this stuff really varies country by country. As, you know, as I said earlier, it's we've seen. Uh, you know, we've seen that sort of decision really impacting ultimately what, what technology they choose. And I think the good thing about an open source solution like OpenStack is, you know, it's, 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 it's basically you get a lot of flexibility and you can, you can operate it yourself or you can easily get a, get a, get a system integrator to operate it for you. I was going to ask you, you know, Sebastian said, uh, you know, kind of OpenStack is that way to go uh, for security on that private side. Is it? Is OpenStack that the, the option for for security and compliance? Um, well, I, I'm, I'm trying to keep my own opinion out of that, but that's just like, I've just seen it over and over again, many, many large customers doing you know, credit card processing, uh, doing, uh, managing healthcare records, managing uh, very, very sensitive intellig uh, intelligence agency information, um, and, and all of that is, uh, you know, you know, they, they all choose to have a tier in which certain workloads are placed in the private cloud and then there's tiers in which it's less sensitive workloads are placed in public cloud. Um, and uh, being able to have like a portfolio of placement options for your workloads is, uh, it, it, you know, is very important, so especially the larger the organization, the more diversified the applications and workloads you have, the more important that becomes. Uh, one quick thing, I think security is more of a process than a technology. So it's, it's all about that discipline, about the vigilance and the, pro the uh, procedures and standards where it is, 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 is important, but I think it's secondary. You know, also like really in terms of technology, I, I wouldn't, uh, right now, uh, I wouldn't equate op OpenStack uh, with, with say private cloud. You know, I think when a lot of people talk about private cloud these days, unfortunately what they mean is a, is a vSphere cluster. And, and that is, you know, I think the meaning of, of private cloud has, a, has evolved quite a bit in the last few years. And, and you know, so so uh, so that's why I, I, I you know I'm I really hope that technologies like OpenStack, CloudStack continue to grow in the private cloud space because I think they do have a significant value add to some of the other proprietary technologies. I'm not trying to pimp VMware here, but let's be careful that we're not becoming bigots with that statement, though, because. The, remember, the purpose of what we're trying to do from a cloud perspective, private or public, is not about the technology. It's about the business enablement side of, of that technology is actually a business partner, not just a, you know, a ticket taker. If we, whether or not VMware is the right cloud for you or here, or, and, and I know this is blasphemy saying this at OpenStack, but that's, that's a business decision. As long as you're delivering on the, the objective around faster time to market with business needs around higher velocity to deliver on whatever the business objective is and or around availability. I, I, you know, we're winning as a, as a team, as an IT organization, we're winning in helping our business succeed. 
So every one of you have, have, have you've all been involved in, in several or many uh, large publicly uh, noted clouds. And they, you know, kind of notably successful clouds. Now what, what how do you define <coughs> success? Naming. Yeah, Z Cloud, for example, it's always naming. Everything started with a Z, it's Zing. It wasn't hard to name that at all. <laughs> you guys have a cloud that starts with a Z? So I was at T-Mobile long before I met Mark, and uh, so this is in 2010, 2011. We had T-Cloud. <laughs> yep, yep. And then uh, rocked it over at Getty, and it is... <laughs> yeah, you guys can figure out where that goes. <laughs> well, is it, is it all about economics? What, what, what is that? How do, how do you guys define a successful cloud? Well... As the business objectives matter, right? Having in, in, in operations, we were all about availability, cost, and deliverability in terms of speed to delivery. And the, the battle I was fighting was most of my customers, those game studios were in Amazon and they, they were fine with it. They were happy there. And most of the business wasn't yet looking at how costly that was. And we had already had raw bare metal servers and data centers running other games, and we knew they were way more performant, and we knew that we could do a better job than some of the issues we had with reliability and what we predicted to be future cost with games growing there. So we sought to go build Z Cloud. So what, what success meant for us was making it, no, <laughs> making it better than Amazon. And that was, that was very much possible, but kind of unpredicted. It was so much better than when the first games moved in, we were able to predict before they moved in that it would be a third the price and twice the performance. When they moved in, what they also was, was the gravy on top of that was the user responsiveness. We had richer CPUs in our Z Cloud that it actually resulted in a more uh, responsive game experience for every user. And it wasn't ever predicted that way, but that was the gravy. And that was kind of the catalyst that once I got my first tenant, which was hard to do, um, everybody was more and more willing to move across, and you needed evangelism along the way to make sure that that, that could happen. Tying back and getting a little more philo philosophical with it, you started with talking about the, the, the tenants. I think that the, the way we measure success on a cloud is the exact same way we measure success in any other area, against the metrics by which we run our business. So from, from my side, in my organization, we, we, we kind of hold a loose framework around what I've kind of created as a, like an AVM model, so availability, velocity, and maturity. So if you can say, like, from an availability perspective, we are meeting ex customer expectations, kind of, it doesn't have to be an SLA, we don't have to get archaic or, or, uh, or draconian about it, but we're meeting expectations with the availability and the investment we have there. Tied to couple that, and almost for me is more important, we're meeting the velocity expectations of our business. We were talking a little bit ago at a meeting. If we, if, if we, it's on our case, it's our marketing team wanting to try stuff out. If we tell our marketing team that they can try one new idea out once every two months, that's a radically different proposition for them than you can try out 10 things and nine of them may fail and that's perfectly fine because we did it really quick. We had a low cost uh, to get that idea out, the business idea out through technology or enabled by technology. So that velocity is really important. And then finally, you have the maturity. Do you have a clear, clear roadmap? Are you continuing to drive up, drive up uh, the value, drive down the cost, et cetera? And so you, I measure it the exact same way I measure yeah. other investments. So, uh, you know, I think from, from, from our point of view, we're mostly a vendor supplying cloud solutions into these organizations, IT organizations and web companies. And for us, the, the measure of success is actually very simple. It just boils down to, all boils down to adoption. Just how many people use it, how, how many virtual machines are created. Just like Mark said, after he deployed Z Cloud, you know, the, once we overcome the technical challenge of getting the cloud deployed, then the next challenge is adoption. How do we get people bring bring workload on it? So, so that's uh, just like any consumer services. You, know, you just start measuring those kind of metrics. You start measuring churn. You start measuring uh, what kind of problem people are having, and, and 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 then solve them. Then then adoption grow, and then the cloud becomes successful. Um, so I'll I'll add a, few, uh, a note to that. So uh, so so scalers implement. Work, we've worked with APIs from from Azure to to Google Compute Engine to Rackspace to uh, you know all of you know, pretty much all of them, and and from really from a technology perspective, um, like a six, like a shitty cloud is going to require ten of the identical same API calls to be able to get that virtual machine started. And once it's started, it's going to take you 50 minutes for that thing to boot up. And once it's booted up, it might have intermittent connectivity issues. 
I mean, that is a really bad cloud experience, which leads to all sorts of frustration from the developers, which ties to what Cheng is, 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 was talking about, which is like, you're not ever going to get internal adoption if you, that's the cloud you're offering your developers. And awesome cloud is going to be something like you know, Amazon or even better, Google Compute Engine, where you make that, you know, that call to, to Google, you're like within 15 to 20 se seconds, your VM is up and running and you can SSH into it and you can start doing stuff. So uh, huge amounts of variability. And, uh, and I've seen OpenStack uh, clouds that where you have like boot from Cinder, but when you're trying to boot from Cinder because of some network issues, it just takes you like an hour to get that VM to, to be launched. So even within OpenStack, there's huge variability in quality. Uh, so it's like ultimately, uh, yeah, I'm not sure if there's a real conclusion, but like the quality of the cloud is also me measured as like real technology metrics, such as like those, those hard, you know, uh, hard you know, numbers of getting stuff done. So let's do a question. Go ahead. Just got a quick question. You know, we've obviously OpenStack, we say software is free. Unfortunately, a lot of the other software we have to run isn't. Uh, you know, on top of the thing, any experiences with the kind of ugly barriers that software companies put in front of? portability of workloads across various flavors of cloud. You know, Amazon took 18 months to negotiate with Larry Ellison how to get Oracle licensing worked out on that platform as a classic industry example. Any experiences you've got in that space? Because that's economic impact, you know, we're all paying for licenses in enterprise agreements and stuff already. Uh, well, well, in the case of Amazon versus uh, you know, Oracle, that was kind of like the... Uh the Cold Cold War nuclear n negotiations, right? Like uh, both uh, both parties, you know, didn't absolutely need to get it done straight away. So they were both you know, playing the waiting game and playing chicken. Um, yeah. I, I would say, I, I don't know if I, uh, I won't give uh, specific examples internally, but I would say we have had problems with Oracle. Uh, we have shockingly had problems with VMware. We've had problems with uh, the challenges with, uh, I, I call it HP, like some of the, some of the vendor, it's not so much vendor lock-in. It, it may be, maybe there is some element of vendor lock-in, but there's also a very real element of it's way easier and way faster to get a product out when you don't have to test it across 30,000 different solutions. There are a lot of modules in OpenStack. And so from that standpoint, Point, there is a lot of, uh, we'll say, incompatibility. Maybe it is nefarious and it is vendor lock-in, maybe it's not, but the, the number one challenge we've had is, is more along the lines of uh, module incompatibility. Yeah. yeah, not specifically to your influencing a commercial license kind of threat, but uh, other strategies to deal with disproportionately expensive services is, you know, prove to that vendor that you are starting to differentiate yourself with a competing technology that is open source, like, my, you know, demonstrate MySQL in some capacity. I don't know if that's going to bother Oracle with as big as they are, but, you know, that concept has worked for, for many of the companies I've worked for um, to, to get that price negotiated. Actually, I'll say real quick, one, not, this is not directly related to the question, but it's almost hilarious. It has been funny to see how differently Oracle treats MySQL and, and Oracle proper. The, like, their uh, BUs are completely different. The way their sales team sells against each other is completely different. It's, it's, it's an interesting thing just to watch to your question around uh, watching that commercial viability versus a, what was an open source and still has open source expectations uh, being trying to be run by a, a large enterprise. So in just a... Uh kind of a, a 30 second answer like being kind of fiscally minded and bringing up your private cloud what i'm gonna go, go with each, each of you like how do you start what is that what's that kind of golden roadmap a lot of customers want to start with oh i want to start with the cheapest hardware the open source version of things and they don't realize how many problems and how many decisions that they're subjecting themselves to that are going to stall them out I think the measure of success is how, how quickly can you get something operational so that you can begin to innovate that with how else you already deliver IT and, and services to your customers. So starting with turnkey solutions, you know, appliances are good, although we just lost Nebula, but the, you know, we've been working with, with uh, Mirantis to do a turnkey, like it's ready to ship. It's, a lot of things have been pre-decided for you, but that's in, in order to save you from playing with the box of razor blades so that you can start and begin to learn about this very complicated technology, but in a way that has been predetermined to be safe, that there are a lot of known quantities around it so that you can begin. And then as you iterate, and it's important to think of your first step in cloud being one that is going to be the first of many. 
many, you're going to be evolving the choices that you make in, in your future clouds. Don't start with a completely open box of Tinker Toys. Start with something that, that has got some form to it, some structure to it that you can count on. Yeah, I think, you know, yesterday's keynote, which I really liked a lot, yesterday morning's keynote, very technical keynote. And I think um, uh, Mark mentioned the, <coughs> Mark mentioned the uh, uh, technology now. Basically, we're muted. Thank you, everyone.